Less than a month after launching the Mir core module, preparations are underway at Bankernor Cosmodrome for Mir EO-1, the first crewed expedition to the new station. Mir had been launched in a hurry. In order to get the station in orbit before the 27th Communist Party Congress in February of 1986, neither the fourth generation Soyuz spacecraft, the TM, nor the TKS derived modules that would eventually be docked to Mir were ready by 1986. The solution was to launch the final Soyuz T mission. The Soyuz T flew from 1979 to 1986 and was a major upgrade over the previous Soyuz spacecraft. Sporting solid-state electronics and a much more advanced onboard computer, these upgrades helped overcome chronic docking problems that plagued cosmonauts during previous space station missions. Additionally, the size of the Soyuz T's allowed enough room for three cosmonauts with pressure suits in case of a rapid depressurization. The new T-series saw a return of the solar panels, which allowed up to 11 days of independent flight and used a redesigned propulsion system the KTDU-426. On the 13th of March, 1986, cosmonauts Leonid Kizim and Vladimir Soluviev took the elevator and climbed into Soyuz T-15 for what would be a historic mission. Soyuz T-15 launched atop the Soyuz U rocket. Of R-7 origin, the same rocket that launched Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin into space, the Soyuz U would become the backbone of the Soviet and Russian space programs. First launched in 1982, Soyuz U was in almost continuous use for almost 44 years. In 1979, it would set a world record for the highest launch rate in any year with 47 flights. Over its operational lifetime, the Soyuz U rocket flew a total of 786 missions. It became one of the most reliable launchers in history, with a success rate of 97.3%, and last launched in 2017. Being a derivative of the R-7, the Soyuz U maintains the famous design of a core booster with four strap-on boosters and an upper stage for orbital insertion. At launch, the core booster and strap-on boosters, making up the first and second stages of the rockets, fire together. The strap-on boosters are powered by four RD-117 rocket engines, burning liquid oxygen and kerosene, and producing 838.5 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level. It's maneuvered with Vernier engines, and it takes only two minutes for those engines to deliver their thrust until they're jettisoned in the famous Korolev Cross. By this time, the cosmonauts are flying at 41 kilometers high and traveling at 8,300 kilometers an hour. Roughly 30 seconds later, the fairing and escape modules jettisoned. The core booster, the Block A, continues to burn. The Block A's four RD-118 engines produce a bit less thrust than the strap-on boosters, clocking in at 792.5 kilonewtons. The second stage runs out of fuel at roughly five minutes after liftoff. The third stage does what's called a hot stage where the engines fire before disconnecting with the second stage. After separating, the third stage, or Block I, pushes the Soyuz T-15 to orbit with four RD-110 engines, pushing 297 kilonewtons of thrust, and burning for about four minutes. It's these engines that give the final thrust to push our astronauts out of gravity's reach. At almost nine minutes after liftoff, the intense acceleration comes to an end and the third stage stops firing. After a few seconds, the crew feels a final jolt and after then, the weightlessness of orbital spaceflight en route to a historic mission. Mir was not the only destination for Soyuz T-15. Rather, the mission plan called for Kazim and Solovyov to first dock with the new station and get it operational. 
The crew would then undock from Mir and fly over to the dead Salyut 7, which had been in orbit since 1982. They would grab supplies and experiments from the old station and return to the new. There had never been a mission like it, nor would there be one after. Soyuz T-15 would be the first and only mission to fly between two space stations in the history of spaceflight. After two days of approaching the station, Kazim and Solovyov began their final approach to Mir. The front port on the station was designed for the newer Soyuz TM craft. The TM used the upgraded Kurs approach system, while the aft port on Mir used the older IGLA system for arriving progress cargo ships. The older Soyuz T also used the IGLA system. So at 20 kilometers, the IGLA system acquired its counterpart on the aft port of Mir. The crew slowly approached the back of the station and slowed their approach. At 200 meters, the crew switched off the IGLA system and manually maneuvered Soyuz T-15 around the station to line up with the front port. Once aligned to the front port, the crew used a laser rangefinder, a trick employed on the earlier Soyuz T-13 mission that docked with the dead Salyut 7 station the year earlier. It worked, and the crew entered the station and began powering up numerous systems and conducting testing on the new station. The work focused primarily on communication systems after the issues Mir had on the ground before launch. A few days after arriving at the station, the crew unloaded the first Progress spacecraft to dock with Mir, Progress 25. Progress 25 undocked from the station on April 20th and re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Three days later, Progress 26 arrived and would remain docked until June of 1986. After six weeks aboard Mir, the EO-1 crew prepared for the transfer to Salyut 7. Soyuz T-15 separated from Mir when Salyut 7 was just 2,500 kilometers away, on May 5th. Prior to undocking, Mir had made several orbital adjustments to conserve Soyuz T-15's fuel supply. The fuel savings would mean that traveling that distance would take 29 hours. On May 6, the crew successfully docked with the inert Salyut 7. The station was covered in ice and without electrical power. The crew repaired the station, regaining power, heat, and environmental control, and began removing experimental results left behind by the last Salyut 7 crew. While scheduled to stay at Salyut 7, the mission calls for a few EVAs. On May 28, the EO-1 crew climbed outside of Salyut 7 to receive space station exposure experiments and tested the deployment canister that converted a folded girder cartridge into a 15-meter girder in only a few minutes. On May 31st, Kazim and Solyov, on another EVA, attached measurement devices to the top of the retracted girder, then re-extended it with an aim towards studying its rigidity. They finished up the five-hour EVA when they used an electron gun to weld several of the girder's joints together and further studying its rigidity. While Soyuz T-15 was away, Soyuz TM-1 arrived at the unmanned and unoccupied Mir station and remained for nine days. Just as Soyuz T was designed for Salyut 7, Soyuz TM was designed for Mir with updated communication and rendezvous equipment. Soyuz TM-1 undocked from Mir on May 29th and returned to Earth. A month later, Progress 26 also undocked from Mir and burned up in the atmosphere. Over the next few days, Mir maneuvered to raise its orbit slightly and move closer to Salyut 7. After a month on the aging Salyut station, Soyuz T-15 undocked from Salyut and returned to Mir on June 25th. In an attempt to forestall re-entry between August 19th and August 22nd, engines on the already docked TKS Cosmos 1686 boosted Salyut 7 to a record high orbital altitude of 475 kilometers. Eventually though, atmospheric drag did take its toll, and the station re-entered the atmosphere over South America four and a half years later. Some pieces of the station were later found in Argentina. Back aboard Mir, Commander Kazim surpassed Valery Rumin's record 
for time spent in space and became the first human to spend a full year in orbit. The EO-1 crew spent their last 20 days on Mir conducting Earth observations and preparing the space station for unoccupied operation. A little over a week after celebrating the latest record broken, Kazim and Soloviov climbed into Soyuz T-15 and departed the station on July 16th. The return to Earth for Soyuz T-15 took less than three and a half hours. The crew undocked and slowly drifted away from the station. After three hours of travel and achieving the correct attitude, the Soyuz spacecraft fires its propulsion module and slows its orbital speed to fall back to Earth. About half an hour after completing the burn, the orbital module, which provides the crew with extra living space during the trip to the station and contains systems vital to rendezvous and docking, is no longer needed and jettisoned. At the same time, the propulsion module, containing the primary guidance, navigation, computer systems, and the spacecraft's two solar arrays, is also released. A secondary guidance, navigation, and control system on the descent module enables the crew to maneuver the vehicle after separation, and Commander Kazim could pilot the module using a rotational hand controller that manages the firing of eight hydrogen peroxide thrusters on the vehicle's exterior. This control system is deactivated 15 minutes before landing when the parachutes are deployed. Having shed two-thirds of its mass, the Soyuz reaches entry interface, a point 400,000 feet above the Earth where friction due to the thickening atmosphere begins to heat the outer surfaces of the craft. With only 23 minutes left before it lands on the grassy plains of Central Asia, attention in the module turns to slowing its rate of descent. Eight minutes later, the spacecraft is streaking through the sky at a rate of 755 feet per second. Before it touches down, its speed will slow to only 5 feet per second, and it will land at an even slower speed than that. Several onboard features ensure that the vehicle and crew land safely and in relative comfort. Four parachutes, deployed 15 minutes before landing, dramatically slow the vehicle's rate of descent. Two pilot parachutes are first to be released, and a drogue chute attached to the second pilot parachute follows immediately thereafter. The drogue, measuring 24 square meters, slows the rate of descent from 755 feet per second to 262 feet per second. The main parachute is the last to emerge. It's the largest chute, with a surface area of over 10,000 square feet. Its harnesses shift the vehicle's attitude to 30 degrees relative to the ground, dissipating the heat and then shifting it again to a straight vertical descent prior to landing. The main chute slows the Soyuz to its descent rate of 24 feet per second, which is still too fast for a comfortable landing. A second before touchdown, two sets of three small engines on the bottom of the vehicle fire, slowing the vehicle and softening the landing. With the first record-breaking crew mission to Mir, the next goal was to begin building the station by adding the new modules. The first would be Kavant 1. 